So to just dive in real briefly before we turn to our speakers, I want to um, mention that IARCTIC is, as many of you know, the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, um, and it brings together 16 different agencies, departments, and offices across the U.S. federal government. Um, so IARPIC works to enhance research on environmental issues in the Arctic. Um, it was created in 1984. And one of the key activities of IARPIC is a five-year research plan. So the most uh, the current Arctic research plan that I'm sure many of you are also familiar with um, was just released in December. You can see an image of the plan here and also learn more about it on the website. And as we release the 2022-2026 the Arctic research plan, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on some of the great work that IARPIC has done in the period of the most recent Arctic research plan from 2020, excuse me, 2017 to 2021. <clears throat> so today's webinar is about the most recent Arctic research plan, 2017 to 2021, which I'll just call the plan so we don't have to keep saying the years. And in the most recent Arctic research plan, there is a ton of, of really great work that folks associated with IARPIC have done. <clears throat> With the, this, this you know, review and reflection of the most recent Arctic research plan, um, we've produced uh, the end of plan report, which you can see the cover of over here on the left. So this serves not only as the biannual report to Congress that's congressionally required of IARPIC, but also as an opportunity to share some of the great work and really impressive science that folks associated with IARPIC has done. So how we formulated this report was to ask all the collaboration teams associated with IARPIC, ask all of the agencies to share just one to two sentences of what they thought were their best highlights of the Arctic research plan. And what we got back were 60 pages of highlights and accomplishments, which really shows you um, all of the great work that folks associated with IARPIC are doing. And so within this end of plan report, um, we have just a subset of those 60 pages of responses, which are themselves just a subset of all the diverse, you know, uh, science and uh, sociology and, and human work that IARPIC has been doing over the last five years. This report is broken down into four chapters, which you can see listed here on the right, focused on the collaborative power of IARPIC, observations and experiments in the Arctic, modeling of, of the Arctic system, and also how we apply the science to very specific human need. And so today we're talking mostly about observations of the Arctic, chapter two, and you're gonna hear from three different groups who will speak a little bit to how their work, um, which is featured in the end of plan report, how their work um, used IARPIC and how their work demonstrates uh, you know, the value of, of IARPIC as a collaborative power. <clears throat> So before I introduce the speakers, I, I, I just want to touch on that a little bit more and frame that much of the work of the most recent Arctic research plan was facilitated through IARPIC collaborations, the online platform, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. So the, the first chapter of the, of the end of plan report, the, the improved collaborations um, also touches to this. So in the period of the most recent Arctic research plan, we saw membership associated with the online platform, iarpiccollaborations.org, grow by over 200%. And of those members, over 75% were non-federal, which really shows the ability of IARPIC to bring together a lot of different groups, not just government, but scientists, community members, um, folks across the country and the world to work together and, and do this work collaboratively. <clears throat> so I encourage you, if you're not already familiar with IARPIC, to please visit IARPICcollaborations.org as well. And much of the work you'll hear about today has benefited from the use of IARPIC collaborations. Um, and so we're going to hear from three groups today, um, oh, excuse me, some formatting errors, three groups today who will touch on, um, some of them will touch explicitly on this. So each group today for a quick run of show is going to talk for about 15 minutes. Um, I want to note that we're trying to save the questions until the very end of the, the hour today because we'd like to have a, a Q&A panel with all of our speakers. Um, so we won't plan on taking questions after each group of speakers um, unless we're really far ahead of schedule. But let me start by first introducing this first set of speakers here who will be talking about the U.S. Arctic Observing Network. So we're going to hear from Sandy Starkweather, Margaret Rudolph, and Maureen Bierman. Um, so Sandy is a research scientist at the University of Colorado, where she uh, leads, on behalf of NOAA, the U.S. Arctic Observing Network, or U.S. AON, initiative. Sandy has worked in a consulting engineering capacity, university research, project management, and planning. And during this time, she spent 12 years traveling to and from Greenland to either participate in or support Arctic field research. She's currently serving as the chair of the Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks, or SEON, and leading SEON's efforts to develop its roadmap for Arctic observing and data system. 
We'll also hear from Margaret Rudolph, who is an interdisciplinary PhD candidate at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She studies co-production of knowledge. Um, she's one of three indigenous liaisons to the Sayan Food Sovereignty Working Group. And then also in this first group, we have Maureen Bierman, who's a project coordinator for the Research Networking Activity Arctic Co-ops and program coordinator for the Center for Arctic Policy Studies at the International Arctic Research Center at University of Alaska Fairbanks. So thanks very much, Sandy, Margaret, and Maureen, and I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thank you, uh, Max, for the introduction and uh, for including so much context on IARPIC and IARPIC collaborations. That'll certainly add context uh, to what we're planning on sharing with you today. Um, so I'm going to start out. Uh, our, our topic here is the, um, oops, sorry, the Arctic Observing Summit. And suddenly my slides don't want to move forward. Uh, I'm sorry, the Arctic Observing Network which is um, actually a subcommittee of the IARPIC. It has both a federal side and a and more open collaboration aspect like IARPIC collaborations itself. And, um, and we have this view graphic uh, to illustrate our structure, which also sort of tells the story of what we're trying to accomplish. So in the center um, of this effort is our federal side of our activities, the USA on board, which is, was established as uh, called for as part of uh, the, the previous plan and was a its establishment was an, a major accomplishment um, of that plan. <clears throat> and as you can see, the, this activity really positions itself um, at the interface between science and technology policy issues, in particular, the, the science and technology issues of Arctic observing, also some of the social issues of Arctic observing, and then the policy and resourcing um, that we need to develop our networks. Um, some other facets of USAON um, include our work that we do through IARPIC collaborations, um, our more open, open partnerships um, that we uh, have established, and also our work as the US Committee to SEON, which is our international planning body for many of these um, same, uh, same visions related to uh, integration of observing and data networks. Here's some members of our current USA on board um, who are gonna be joined shortly by Rachel Daniel of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as Tom Murray of USGS. Um, in addition to establishing the board and their terms of reference, the deliberations of the board over the last few years have really set a vision for what they'd like to see USA on do as an activity, which is currently to focus on doing gaps analyses and for developing action items that can address gaps. And in particular, to frame gaps analyses through the lens of uh, shared societal benefit. So this concept of shared benefit um, is at the center of some of our planning tools and planning frameworks that we've been seeking to develop under this, uh, under this plan. So explicitly, I'm gonna turn to some of the language that was in the previous plan, because it's a little bit of a framework for um, how we've used the collaboration team to inspire dialogue, to move things forward that were called for. So the establishment of USAON was a research objective um, under the environmental intelligence goal in the plan. And there were two aspects um, that were uh, deemed as uh, significant areas that needed progress. One was to really draw ourselves together in clear support for SEAN, draw national support together for the effort, the international planning efforts of sustaining Arctic observing networks. I'll touch on a little bit of what we've done there in a moment. But the second piece is a little bit more what Maureen's going to speak to, which was the establishment of, uh, of research networking activities um, that can be funded through the academic community to begin to build the collective capacity we need to realize the observing systems. The uh, conversation that Margaret's going to touch in on also relates to this bullet, but it extends it um, into the space of how are we engaging with and networking with Indigenous peoples in our work uh, and, and beyond. Um, this body has been co-chaired by Will Ambrose and Sally McFarlane and myself over the last period, and we're now joined by Craig Scheifluck from the University of Alaska Fairbanks to support our future efforts. So what are we doing um, in terms of supporting SEON? 
Well, one thing that we've been really focused on is uh, is is weighing in on the tools that are needed for um, what's known as SEAN's Roadmap for Arctic Observing and Data Systems, which is a, a, a framework planning effort, a partnership development effort to draw together um, partners around key areas for action. Um, so we know there's a lot of linked and related needs. The roads process is one where we're trying to identify where there's really big intersections in interests and to focus there first so that we can yield multiple dividends from our investments um, in Arctic observing. Again, the roads process, uh, you know, queuing off the advice from the USA on board and other, other parties as well is really based around this concept of do this around shared benefit rather than how it had been traditionally done uh, driven by research questions. Research questions are in the mix, but they're not driving it. So this is one example um, of the kind of dialogue that we had inside our ARPIC collaborations team within the SEON board and that uh, we feel has really helped put SEON on a path uh, towards strong planning methodologies. Further, uh, we've used the IARPIC collaboration space um, as a place to both prepare for and learn from Arctic observing summits. So Arctic observing summits are major efforts under SEON. Um, it's a biennial uh, grassroots gathering of more than 300 people from dozens of countries that support these goals of integrating and improving our observing networks and our data systems in support of societal benefit. We used our team space, uh, oops, that's my, that's my buzzer. We used our team space um, to both prepare for the summits and to formulate plans of action um, from the recommendations from the summit. So I'm gonna turn it over to Maureen now and she'll talk about, um, a, a, about a project that came out of those dialogues. Thanks, Sandy. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Maureen Bierman. I am currently project coordinator for the RNA Co-Ops Project. It's an NSF-funded uh, research networking activity for sustained coordinated observations of Arctic change. And I am um, currently at uh, International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, though I am based on Ute territory in Colorado. Um, so I want to talk a little bit first about the RNA Co-ops project and then how it has um, been, been relying on the IARPIC observing space as well. So we've really used it kind of significantly, the IARPIC observing space, to prepare for Arctic observing summits, as Sandy mentioned, to engage the research community in summit participation, and to use this engagement to set the agenda nationally. Um, and a key case in point here is the emergence of the RNA Co-ops project, which was prompted by work at the 2018 Arctic Observing Summit in Davos, Switzerland. It was at this meeting that preliminary work was undertaken that eventually led to the formulation of the SEAN roads process that Sandy discussed a bit. And this meeting also saw a budding recognition of the need for equitable and observing observation systems. And um, it also, uh, also started to recognize that creating space for increased and sustained indigenous participation would require both additional support and resources. So this ended up leading to the eventual creation of funding for the Indigenous Liaison Road uh, role. And this is something that my colleague, Margaret Rudolph, will be talking about more in a moment. And it, it really emerged alongside the formulation of the proposal for the RNA uh, co-ops activity. Um, can you go to the next slide? Thanks, Sandy. So here we are breaking down some of the RNA co-ops principal goals. It includes a number of key outcomes um, related to Arctic observing that range from working with the Food Sovereignty Working Group and AOS Food Security Working Group to support food security and information needs in the Pacific Arctic sector, uh, all the way to influencing the kind of meta structure of the Arctic observing system. Um, and we're doing this by trying to work to um, support the anchoring of the Arctic observing summit within SEAN and transitioning it from a biannual uh, biennial event meeting to an ongoing and sustained process. In line with these, RNA co-ops also aims to serve as an example of implementation of the SEAN roads process to support the growth of a community of practice that can address observing issues across a range of skill sets and silos and to build capacity with Alaska Native Indigenous Peoples Organizations. And lastly, to develop tools and information pro uh, products that can advance shared societal benefits and the fair care data stewardship principles. 
So um, as we have are trying to do all this, IARPIC and specifically the IARPIC observing team platform have provided really significant opportunities for RNA co-ops to achieve these things, both in terms of bringing together our project's team members and also by serving as a hub for connecting our team with the broader observing community as we work toward refining the context of Arctic observing and activities like Sand Roads and the Arctic Observing Summit. Uh, next slide, please, Sandy, thanks. So um, sort of the context that we're working in, right, is that sustained Arctic observations provide shared societal benefits to Arctic and non-Arctic countries. It's important globally. Um, collaboration and sustained observations currently lacks processes and capacity to support convergence toward a common observing framework. There's a diverse set of, uh, of efforts going on. There's often uh, issues with accessibility um, and access. Uh, more broadly for both, uh, you know, sharing across uh, research efforts, but then also sharing across scales and with local communities as well. And SAN's broader vision is for a connected, collaborative, and comprehensive long-term pan-Arctic observing system that serves societal needs. Um, in recognition of these points, RNA Co-ops is trying to address the following key questions. How do we move from vision to specific action? And then what are the most pressing coordinated observing needs? As we move towards AOS 2022, it will offer support of these activities in a few specific ways. First, AOS serves as an arena for coordinating across existing observing efforts and activities in the Arctic and fosters linkages from regional to global efforts. And second, AOS will offer an, uh, an arena for mobilizing inclusive expert panels that move forward the process for identifying, identifying shared Arctic variables and for continuing momentum building around the issues of indigenous participation and representation. These efforts are going to be really key in shaping the long-term progression of the RNA co-ops project. Um, and here you see this kind of tidy diagram that was, uh, I think, included or came sort of recently out of the, the RNA um, project proposal. Um, and it, it, while it's nice and kind of straightforward, it really hides the nonlinearities and the complexities of the, the project in implementation. We're talking about um, a lot of different moving parts, a lot of different interests. Uh, a wide variety of skills just within our academic team. And then we're trying to make linkages with people living in Alaska, um, you know, in communities in the Arctic. And so it, it's just, it, the challenge is really um, moving from this kind of linear planned progression uh, to the realities of doing a project like this on the ground. And what's emerged in our first year and a half is a clear need for our project team to maintain flexibility and agility in our design and plan as we move forward in order to best work with and learn alongside the Indigenous liaison team that links us with both the Food Sovereignty Working Group and Arctic inhabitants, inhabitants and communities more generally. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Margaret Rudolph. Thanks. Hi, thanks. Um, so I wanted to give a brief introduction to the Food Sovereignty Working Group. So it was a group that grew out of the last AOS in 2020 with the Food Security Working Group. Um, a large group, mostly Alaskan-based, started meeting more regularly and to continue working on Indigenous food sovereignty issues, research protocols, and observing through an Indigenous lens. RNA Clubs is funding three Indigenous liaisons, myself, Craig Chifluk, and Victoria Bushman to work. But I wanted to emphasize that the Food Sovereignty Working Group is something that's separate from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And so if you go to the next slide. And so thinking about the last five years, something I wanted to honor is the Indigenous leadership in this area of space. The first person that came to mind, of course, was Lena Kilson Holmes. So I dug up uh, AOS 2016 photo of her in action. Uh, I think her work and her legacy is really important. Also for me personally, Rachel Daniel has been a great mentor, um, the work of ICC and just so many others. And a lot of that work, I wanted to kind of emphasize that that was a lot of in-kind contributions as well as voluntary work. And so if you go to the next slide. And so thinking about what IARPIC as well as SEON, AOS, RNA clubs, is that they have been platforms discuss indigenous engagement and then observing through indigenous lens. But I also look back and I see there's so much more work to do in this area with indigenous engagement, doing actual co-production of knowledge work, inclusion of indigenous knowledge systems in observing beyond just community-based monitoring, impacting policies and decision makings and because that's what's actually impacting food security, as well as building capacity to do this work. There's very few indigenous people in these spaces as well as people who can do community-driven work. Um, so with that, that kind of 
sets us forward. And I think the last slide, I'll hand it back to Sandy. Um, that's just our, our thanks for your attention um, and our contact information if you have uh, more questions about this work. And I will hand it back now to Max. Thanks so much. That was a really uh, informative presentation. I really enjoyed hearing that. Um, so just as a reminder, we're going to save questions until the very end of the conversation today. But if you have any questions, write them down and um, we can throw them into chat later and, and ask them to these speakers. Um, so our next speaker is um, Pam Susanis. Pam is a physical scientist with the U.S. National Park Service. She has spent more than 25 years working in the national parks of Alaska. Uh, most of that time is spent in Denali National Park and Preserve. She's currently responsible for monitoring climate and weather in eight national parks in northern Alaska, an area that covers more than 40 million acres of land. So thanks so much, Pam, for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Um, just want to make sure that you can see my slides. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Pam Susanis. I work in the National Park Service and I'm a scientist that works specifically in the um, Northern National Parks. And I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to share some of the work that we are doing um, and how it fits in with the understand how it fits in with understanding changes in high latitudes. So the work I'm going to talk about um, is based on the question of how climate is changing in Alaska National Parks and how does that translate across the landscape. Um, and it really leads back to the whole mission or the whole idea of the National Park Service and the mission um, is basically a dual mission where we um, it's both to conserve the park resources, but also provide for their use and enjoyment in such a manner and by such a, a means as will leave them unimpaired for future generations. Um, and that's a really challenging mission in this time of, of rapid Arctic change. So our National Park Service Inventory and Monitoring Program is a long-term ecological monitoring program that tracks vital signs that kind of help us understand the changes on these landscape on the landscape. Um, and one of the um, objectives is to provide relevant, timely, scientifically sound information on the status and trends of resource condition. Um, and this is um, so that we can help managers make better science-based decisions so that we can include this information that we're gathering into park planning efforts um, so that we can share these data with the larger research community and IARPIC collaborators um, included. Um, and then also to pass on this knowledge to park visitors and to educators so that we, we share all of the information that we're gathering. And the nice thing about a long-term monitoring program is that it offers stability and support. Oops, didn't mean to advance so quickly. Um, it offers a stability and support for um, continuous observations, which is kind of a, um, it's not very common or very easy when we're talking about the Arctic and subarctic environments. So in Alaska, we have four different um, inventory and monitoring networks as part of the National Park Service program. Um, and I just put them on the map for scale, just to talk about how much land we're talking about. So the, the um, networks in the Arctic are the Arctic, or we've got the Arctic network parks up north. We've got the central Alaska parks um, in the central part of the state. And then we've got the Southwest and the Southeast national parks. Um, and at all of these, in all of these networks, the suite of vital signs that we are collecting information on include things like climate, um, vegetation, permafrost, glaciers, um, all of the wildlife, um, and many of other different things. So our piece of the puzzle is continuous observation. So we're collecting information at these remote automated sites and we collect um, air temperature, summer rainfall, wind speed and wind direction, um, ground temperatures, solar radiation, and we collect these 365 days of year, 24 hours a day. Um, and when we designed this program, we designed it purposefully, and we designed it with the help and guidance of the Alaska climate community. We realized that there were gaps in the state. Um, so we kind of purposefully put these, um, these sites in locations where we needed the information the most. And I think it really is a pretty, it, it came out to be a pretty robust design. I call it the field to data archive process. So we are, the, we are the folks that go out in the field, we've installed these sites, we calibrate the instrumentation, we give it the human oversight they need. Um, but then we also do all of the metadata. We do the QA, QC, um, and we make sure that these data are available um, in an archive and for everyone to use. 
So where are our sites? Um, we have about 50 climate stations now in the 16 national park units in Alaska. It covers about 54 million acres and more than half of the land that the National Park Service manages in the US. Um, and when we designed this, we looked at areas where there were current observations and those were all at low elevations and towns um, and in coastal areas at airports. So the MPS afforded the opportunity to get some of these other locations instrumented. So we kind of targeted the mountainous observations or the mountainous areas. Um, so now we have actually more than a decade of continuous monitoring at many of these locations, um, and in some cases, 15 years of data. And I just wanted to just walk you through just to give you a sense of space and scale of where these um, these stations are located. So we've got stations in the Chugach and Wrangell Mountains, in Wrangell St. Elias, across the Brooks Range in Gates of the Arctic and Noatak National Preserve. We've got sites that are located along the Chukchi Sea in Cape Krusenstern, where we have some muskox visitors, um, and also in the um, interior Seward Peninsula at Serpentine Hot Springs. Um, we've got sites in the boreal forest of Yukon Charlie National Preserve and in the tundra areas of the Alaska Range. We also um, expanded our scope and our capabilities through partnerships. Um, we realized we couldn't do it all well, so um, we've partnered with um, the Natural Resource Conservation Service so that we can get better year-round precipitation data. We're always open to hosting um, the NOAA Climate Reference Network sites when they would want to work in the parks. Um, anytime there's a cooperative observer, observing station in a park, we like to keep those long-term observations going and, and help and support in any way we can. And we also help with the logistics of the fire weather monitoring program that um, is a statewide effort. And it's all driven by um, our, our main objectives, which were to monitor and record um, these weather conditions at representative locations so that we can identify long and short-term trends um, one of the key things is to provide these data to other researchers to make it available. And then also um, to, to participate in larger um, climate monitoring and modeling efforts like that. The, the PRISM um, modeling effort was one of the examples. Our data from some of the Arctic sites were able to really help um, with the, the latest round of climatological maps that were produced for Alaska, the 1981 to 2010 um, maps. So now the next couple slides, I'm just going to talk about some recent work that we did um, and that was featured in the IARPIC um, report. So we, um, using the station data from the National Park Service sites that we put in in about the mid-2000s, we observed an abrupt shift in mean annual temperatures that started in 2014 and then persisted for the next six years. And this, we noticed this at, at um, over 30 climate stations in the Northern National Parks. Um, and on the map, you can see these are, uh, I apologize for the acronyms, but those little, the, the site names are the four little acronyms. And you can see this is the mean annual temperature, ch the, the change in mean annual temperature between those two time periods. So we looked at 2006 to 2013, and then also 2014 to 2019. And this is the change that we observed um, uh, in that time period, in that, that abrupt shift between those two time periods. And you can also see that we um, did the analysis for the climate, of the the Alaska Climate Divisions, and that the, the gradient of warming was really, you could really see the warming a lot more out on the West Coast. And that was a function of uh, lack of sea ice and those really warm ocean temperatures that persisted during those years, 2014 to 2019. So this is just like a simplified time series graph of, of what we observed. Um, the average annual air temperatures during that 2014 shift increased by about 1.5 to 3 degrees C at these sites. Um, and this full period of record um, is from the long-term observing stations that are around the parks and they go back to 1950s. Um, and in this time series, it shows mean annual air temperature, I apologize, on the y-axis and then time on the x-axis. Um, you could see two abrupt shifts in, 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 in increasing temperatures um, over this time series, one that's a pretty well documented shift in the 1970s. And then that blue circle kind of indicates where our, um, our climate stations came into play and we observed them at all, at all of our sites and all of the long-term sites. Okay, I really apologize for this graph, but um, I just want, to walk you through it pretty quickly, um, it, it shows that um, not only the air temperatures increased 
during this time period, but the ground temperatures also increased. So we've got the mean temperature um, on the y-axis. And then along the bottom, it's just the park name, the park acronym, and then the site name. So for example, the first one is Bering Land Bridge and Devil, Lake, Devil Mountain Lakes. Um, and the circles on this map are air temperature and the triangles are soil temperature. And blue indicates that these were the temperatures between 2013 and two, or 2006 and 2013, so pre-2014. And then the red indicates that abrupt shift in the temperatures. And I just want to point out um, that all of them, all of it, the air temperatures and soil temperatures increased for all of our sites. But if you look at that dashed line, the zero degree C line, you can see that some of these, in some of these locations, the, the ground temperatures at these Arctic sites um, that have permafrost actually rose above freezing, which indicates thaw. And this is just a, the same exact graph, but it's for um, our sites that we've got in the central Alaska parks. And these are warmer parks, so we've got warmer air temperatures, um, and many of these are actually above freezing already. But you could see um, that the, the, the sites that have permafrost I should have said this on the preceding slide, but the sites that have permafrost actually have those blue bars over the top of their names. And you can see for the Central Alaska sites that do have permafrost present that the air and ground temperatures are really close to that zero degree C freezing threshold. And this has implications for permafrost. So if we look at these permafrost maps that were produced by Panda et al for the Park Service in 2014 and 2016, we can see that an increase in just a few, an increase of just a few degrees means that a lot of these locations will thaw. So the, the top panel, um, panel A is the Arctic parks and um, the panel B is Denali National Park and panel C is Wrangell St. Elias. And the blue colors indicate that that permafrost is pretty cold, um, about minus three degrees C. But anything in the red and yellow areas is um, just below freezing. So meaning that all of these locations that have red and yellow sh shading are susceptible to thaw. So this is just another really interesting graph and I promise it's the last graph, um, but we found that in areas with low snow um, that the ground temperatures increased by as much as air temperatures, but in areas that had deep snowpacks, the ground temperatures increased by only half that of air temperatures. So this graph on the y-axis, we have the mean ground temperature change. Again, it's between those two periods, the 26 to 2013 versus the 2014 and 2019. So it's the change in temperatures in between those periods. So mean annual ground, ground temperature on the y-axis and then mean annual air temperature change on the x-axis. Um, and the Arctic parks, that's the acronym ARCN, um, basically as it was a one-to-one -one relationship. So the ground temperatures increased by as much as the air temperatures. And the Central Alaska Parks, the CAKN, um, increased by only half as much. And you could see um, the two photos um, just show you the difference in the snowpack. So um, the, top, the top photo just shows a typical scoured Arctic site with low snow. And then um, the bottom photo shows a typical deep snowpack um, that we find in a lot of the central Alaska parks. So um, the central Alaska parks with the permafrost and um, ground temperatures that are hovering right, up, right at freezing are really undergoing rapid change. Um, and a few degrees change really does matter in these parks. So our, we're continuing our um, observations all the time. We've got the, the, a pretty good data set. We've got 15 years of data where we can start to look at trends, but we also wanna capture the rare events um, like the extreme rain on snow event that just happened at Denali Park this past December um, where we had record snowfall and precipitation or the really cold wind chills that we capture at um, our, our um, weather station at Howard Pass and no attack or a deluge that occurred um, at the end of June last summer, or yeah, last summer. Um, but basically, I, you know, I just kind of want to bring it back to the IRPIC goals um, and talk about integration and collaboration for these last few slides. Um, the, as NPS scientists, we're, we're starting to weave together these physical and biological components to tell the whole story. Um, 
but we really want to make sure that our data are relevant. We want to make sure that our data are shared with um, as many groups as possible. Um, and that's where we can always do better with um, integration and collaboration. So just a few parting thoughts. Um, we've got more than 10 years of data and we're still collecting it. Um, and we're really set up to measure the change that is currently unfolding. Um, and I, I just wanted to point out the, that the Alaska Parks um, can play a role in the public's understanding of Arctic changes. We get um, some of the large parks in Alaska, we get really um, high visitation rates and we get people from all over the world. And it's a really great opportunity to share some of these things that we're finding through IARPIC and through our um, MPS inventory and monitoring program um, to share all of these things with the general public so that they can understand. Um, and it's super important. Um, this has been brought up in, in that presentation before mine, but we need to really listen and learn from the people who live on these lands in order to make our, our science more relevant. So um, with that, I will uh, end my show and pass it back to Max. Great. Thank you so much, Pam. That was a really interesting presentation. I love all the pictures are so beautiful. <clears throat> so as a reminder, we'll be saving questions until the very end of the talk, but please, you know, be thinking about your questions, write them in the chat, and we can follow back up with them. Um, and, and Pam, if you could stop sharing the screen too. Yeah, thanks. Um, so our next group of speakers uh, is from a, a variety of groups. We have Dr. Jackie Grabmeyer, David Allen, and also Frank Rack. Um, so ja Jacqueline Grabmeyer is a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences, Chesapeake Biological Laboratory in the US. She received her PhD in biological oceanography from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Her oceanographic research interests include pelagic benthic coupling, um, benthic carbon cycling and benthic faunal population structure in relation to ecosystem structure and polar marine ecosystems. She's led multiple interdisciplinary Arctic programs and is currently the lead scientist for the Distributed Biological Observatory in the Pacific Arctic, which has been supported since 2010 by multiple agencies in the US and international collaborators in the Pacific Arctic Group. She's also a co-chair of the IRPIC Marine Ecosystem Collaborations Team. And today she's joined by um, David Allen and Frank Rack. So David joined um, GOMO at NOAA in December, 2019 as the Arctic Research Program Manager. He's worked in the DC metro area since uh, he started work for the Global Change Research Program in 2003 to 2015. Um, during, during his tenure at USGCRP, he focused on interagency and international research cooperation. Um, and he's worked with colleagues um, from counterpart international agencies uh, across the world. Um, David has a bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts at Boston, um, and he began his exploration of marine sciences um, at the Northeastern University East-West Marine Biology Program and obtained a master's degree from the University of Washington School of Oceanography, which is where he was introduced to the Arctic and worked on low temperature microbiology, including cruises aboard the U.S. Uh, Coast Guard Cutter Polar Sea and the Canadian Coast Guard ship Louis Saint Laurent. And then finally, um, Frank Brack will also be speaking with this group. Frank joined the National Science Foundation as a program manager for the Arctic Research Support and Logistics Program in the Office of Polar Programs in 2016. He's primarily responsible for reviewing fieldwork support requirements and for facilitating the implementation of NSF funded projects based in Alaska and on vessels operating in the Arctic Ocean and surrounding seas. So thanks all three of you for being here today and chatting and I'll pass it over to Jackie. Thank you, Max. Uh, thank you all for uh, participating in today's call. And I think the introduction you can see, I'd like to present on the highlights from the DBO, the Distributed Biological Observatory, in the context also of the COVID-19 impacts. And that's something that uh, Frank and uh, David will come up at, towards the end of the talk to, to do a round table on that discussion. So first of all, uh, under IARPIC on the five-year plan and now into the next five-year plan, <clears throat> Um, I, uh, the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, it provides a forum for discussions for the DBO for networking, for looking at uh, working on cross support, and as well as uh, discussions about how to address some of these performance elements that we bring forward at an interagency level. And I would just point out the three core ones on the top in a connection with the Arctic Observing Network. Um, we look at uh, continually do the DBO on five focus stations and also make the data uh, publicly available. Uh, the goal is to develop through IRPIC and through the Pacific Arctic Group so to coordinate these activities. And besides the field work, we're talking also about annual uh, uh, workshops, including data workshops, and also participating uh, biennially in 
and these uh, international meetings. I would like to point out that uh, DBO is, in, we've had engagement and is part of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development for the Arctic Plan. And it's been uh, endorsed, uh, that plan under UNESCO and the United Nations. We also build, try to, uh, now working uh, to build increased connectivity with uh, community-based observing, such as uh, Sandy and others mentioned for the RNA uh, co-ops, as well as the AAOKH, which is the uh, Alaska Arctic Observing Knowledge Hub. Um, we also have uh, uh, interface with the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observing Network. So uh, we, within the DBO, was built at the international level during the PAG meetings way back uh, before uh, it started in 2010. There's standardized sampling at designated biological hotspots. Uh, they, we collaborate with other programs that are working in the field. We often share ship times, both the US and internationally. And that's one of the reasons we took advantage of the international ships and national ships coming through Bering Strait. And we developed, these are, you can see these sites, they're uh, standard stations. These are bounding boxes. So when we have uh, folks doing marine mammal and seabird surveys or other ships are in that area where they can do those observation. And we initiated the five and they've extended over to the, uh, into the Canadian Arctic archipelago uh, that as part of these uh, eight uh, bounding box stations. And I would just point out that there's ongoing development for the Atlantic and Pacific DBO as we build the Pan-Arctic Network. We have core standard sampling, and uh, this is common for oceanography. Look at temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, carbon products, nutrients. And then we're particularly interested in the biological aspects and the key drivers for them. So we're looking at different types of plankton. We're looking at animals in the sediments. But we want to also include the seabird and marine surveys into that to put it in context of predator prey. Uh, we have uh, periodic fisheries acoustics and bottom trawling uh, work that's primarily done by our NOAA collaborators. At the same time, there are gliders, moorings, sail drones, satellite observations as part of the interagency network that are providing data, data sets. And then we have this cooperative data sharing plan at the national and international level. So just briefly to show uh, the field programs, this is just the 20 to 2021. Uh, the, uh, we, you can see, I'm not gonna go through all of them except to the point out that we had an issue in 2020. We were not able to do benthic sampling due to COVID outbreak. Uh, it was a, a small component of the science party. We then were able to put it in uh, through cooperative, uh, through the RARPIC and, and connectivity with the agencies to go out on the Norseman. One important science finding is that there was a late season bloom in October. Um, on standard, we uh, go out on the, with our Canadian colleagues on the uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier. It was canceled in 2020 by our Canadian friends because of COVID, but it did go out in full capacity in 2021, but it required uh, two weeks quarantine and getting across the Canadian border. Um, we did have a plan on our NOAA effort to go out on the uh, discovery, but a COVID outbreak and instead we were able to put together and work with our agency uh, leads to be able to go out on the Sekuliak. And the exciting part there was we were able to sample when ice was forming and we, and you can see the, some of the stations here. And then this, this is just outlined some of our international collaborators and national collaborators that occupy the, these DBO lines. And then we share, we have meetings to share the data. Briefly, we're looking at sea surface and uh, surface seawater temperatures. Upper left is get, looks at the timing of the sea ice and how long it stays there. And the bottom line that you're seeing is if you come to 2018, we barely had any sea ice in the DBO1 area south of St. Lawrence Island. This is due to the extremely warm water uh, coming in from the Pacific and it had an impact all the way up through in, into the uh, transport of material into the outer shelf into the basin. Um, we also, uh, Karen Fry is putting these together. We have a, her paper submitted to our DBO special issue. On the lower left is a, just looking at the temperature changes, particularly, you know, I wanna notice the, how warm the right, bright reds, because in 2018 to 19, we had over five degrees difference in these waters. This has a real impact on the biological uh, composition and the carbon transformations that occur. Just one example, I'm looking at my time, uh, one example of the, um, uh, what we get off of various ships, temperature, salinity, we look at the fluorescence, and we're out there in July, 
Again, here's this big pulse of warm water, particularly in the Alaska coastal water, which is over off of Point Hope here. And then you can see down here, uh, the fluorescence is an indication of where the bloom that had occurred and left the signature of oxygen in the upper water column is settling down into the mid depth. So another indication uh, impact of these declining uh, uh, sea ice, you can see this in September in the upper left, is that we're seeing the harmful algal blooms, which is feeds into the food security aspects for the lower to upper trophic levels. Uh, these, this is a recent paper by Don Anderson. This is a cyst bed where these organisms are actually overwintering. And with the warmer water that are being seen, they're being consumed by benthic prey, as well as organisms in the upper water column, then moving through the food web from marine mammals, seabirds up to humans. And so that is being tracked uh, by a network, Alaskan uh, HABS network. One example as we move through out of the fields uh, shipboard base is to look at the moorings. And this is just an example from a uh, collaboration. Uh, this is by North Pacific Research Board funding. There's an ongoing Chukchi ecosystem with the Alaska Ocean Observing System and the NPRB coordinated program called Asgard. And this is sediment traps. And I bring this up because this is DVO 2, 3, and 4. And we've successively put in a sediment trap into the DVO1, which is the most southern one. You can see the sea ice, the timing of the sea ice retreat, impacts on chlorophyll. Zooplankton comes later in the season, particularly as you head from south to north. And then these are the benthic organisms that we see uh, coming into the upper water column system. Then we're interested in the prey and benthophores or animals that feed on them. And this is an example of gray whales. There's been a contraction of their prey base northward with warming seawaters. And there's also been an increased amount of krill. So these animals are able to utilize both forms of prey. Another organism that we're looking at is a spectacle to eider. It's a threatened diving sea duck. And it also has reduction of the sea ice has limited in the food for platform uh, for them to sit on. They lose more energy if they're in the water than if they're sitting on sea ice. And at the same time, the prey base underneath them is also contracting northward. So that's having a, a negative impact on the quality of the food for these organisms. One example of research to management is the potential impacts of the ship strikes. Uh, this is an example for a paper Sue Moore has in, uh, in revision and submitted. Uh, this is the benthic work that we do. And you can see the hot spots of some of these uh, amphipod crustaceans that these animals feed upon. And then on the right is we're providing this information for concerns of commercial fishing uh, and potential strikes, not only for gray whales and baling whales, but also for seabirds particularly eiders that are in their migratory pathway. I'd like to conclude by these are research highlights and publications. We do have a website where you can uh, download or look at least get the DOI numbers on these publications. But I would just point out, you know, we have things from Phyllis Stabenow talking about the physics and chemistry. Bob Picard put together uh, the drivers of the biomass in the Barrow Canyon, a warm anomaly on export fluxes, a video of, of the communities across the DBO lines. There's modeling involved in the DBO program and the impact of sea ice changes on walruses are just some examples. Oh, that's my time. Uh, to close, we have DB, uh, DBO data access products. Uh, they, we have, you can access uh, data sets at the Arctic Data Portal, depending on the agencies that you can axiom uh, the, the National Centers for Environmental Information. Uh, this physical oceanography of Bob maintains a, a site there, Hui. NASA is involved. They're building a really nice, uh, they have a really nice website for products for the DBO. And a lot of the seabird observations are in the uh, North Pacific uh, database. And these are some examples of the distributed but connected uh, data centers. So I just want to say thank you. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to uh, Frank and David, but would say that we're seeing seasonal and annual changes using these time series. Uh, embedded both on specific DBO cruises as well as ones that are embedded in process to look, identify the and track environmental changes as well as impacts on the ecosystem. A variety of people to thank here, websites you can see, this PowerPoint will be presented on the, um, will be available on the IARPIC website. And at this point, I'm gonna pass this over to Frank and David to do a small, uh, uh, to a presentation on some discussion topics in what we've envisioned as a roundtable. 
So Frank, do you want to go first and then David, just because I have sure. your order? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Basically just tried to list some thoughts to uh, lessons learned or, or examples of how to do something. Um, when this cruise was canceled, the, the PIs, uh, Seth Danielson and, and Jackie Grebmeyer, reached out to their program managers, both David, uh, and then they also contacted me at NSF. Um, and that gave us some time to assess what was the situation, what were the implications for the, the crews that got canceled, uh, issues related to freight and cargo, um, as well as what are the options for how could we recover from this and what, what might be, we be able to do. So don't be afraid to contact your agency leads uh, to explore field support options if you have uh, a problem that, that arises. Um, and be prepared to explain the situation, uh, outline the challenges in rescheduling, um, and, and really give that picture to your agency leads so they can assess and, and figure out what might be possible. Um, and then that gives us a chance to try to resolve uh, some of the challenges. So in this case, uh, David and I talked and we shared it with colleagues at both in NOAA and NSF and figured out that, you know, it'd be possible to reschedule uh, the crews on Sekuliak. And then it was a discussion about how many days might be possible. How could we deal with the financial issues across a fiscal year boundary? And, and we really had like a month and a half uh, to kind of get it together and mobilize a solution. Uh, and that involved uh, logistical issues that David can talk to uh, related to the previous cruise and the cargo in Dutch Harbor having to get to Nome. Uh, but then it, it allowed us to create a solution um, that was pretty unique and it, it allowed the cruise to go forward in the time series to be continued. And I'll stop there and let David uh, speak to some of the other issues. Hey, um, thanks, Jackie, and thanks, Frank, um, for the for the opening up the sort of discussion. I realize that we're we're getting short on time, so I won't I won't say too much in addition. But I did want to acknowledge. Um, I know this has been across the board in IARPIC um, uh, that you know the pandemic has been extremely difficult for field activities, um, and there have been massive impacts across uh, across the entire research research spectrum. But it takes people like um, like Jackie, Seth, um, uh, Lee, and others who are on the phone, um, uh, and they're they're just amazing dedication and willingness to um, uh, to to maintain these these sort of critical observations throughout uh, the pandemic and beyond. Um, and you know uh, while you know we can be receptive as agencies uh, to to challenges, it takes uh, it takes these dedicated PIs um, uh, to really to really make all of this possible and happen. Um, and I also wanted to give a shout out to, um, uh, of course, to uh, interagency colleagues in general, um, but particularly NSF in this, in this particular instance, because we, we, we really were in a, um, uh, in sort of a, a, a big bind as far as the cancellation of the cruise. And finally, I wanted to acknowledge that um, the familiarity and the, um, and the, the collaborations and, uh, and uh, development of relationships that happens in IARPIC is absolutely critically um, critically important, both for development of these uh, highly embedded and integrated scientific programs such as the DBO, but also in terms of the relationships between um, program offices and program managers. Um, and with that, I wanted to to, to sort of stop and um, and see whether there uh, see whether there are questions uh, before before we go too much longer. Thanks. Well, thank you to all three of you for, for sharing that um, presentation. That was very interesting. Before we get to questions, let me share my screen again. Um, I just want to make a, a quick highlight, which is that um, this, first of all, thank you to all the speakers that are here today. This was a really great conversation and thanks to everybody who tuned in. I'm going to mention that this is just one of three webinars in this series. Our next webinar will focus on science for human applications. Um, that will be February 8th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. You'll be able to find more information about that on the IRPIC website.
So now I know that we're, we're very close to time, which is my fault for talking too much. Um, but I want to just say thanks again to all our speakers. And hopefully folks will be able to stick around just for a few extra minutes. If there's any questions, please feel free to put your questions into the chat box. We can read them aloud. I see there's already one or two. Um, or raise your hand and we can also um, have you just ask your question directly. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started with the questions that are in the chat. And I think the first one is from Pam. Um, and the question is, I'm wondering if there's been any consideration for establishing new monitoring stations with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services coastal wilderness areas in southwest Alaska, areas like the Simonyov, Simeonov Wilderness Area or Bering Sea. I think that's, I don't know if Pam, you're able to, are you still there? Oh, yep. Um, yeah. yeah, that wasn't from me. Um, sorry, for you, I think. I, yeah, before me, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I am not aware of any of the, um, of any U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service stations in that area. Um, I focus mostly in the northern area, and I know they do have them in the Selawik National Wildlife Refuge and in some other areas, but I'm not certain um, if there's any plans or if there are any um, weather stations down in, in that area. Thanks, Pam. Um, we also have another question in the chat from Adelheid Herman. Um, I'm wondering how some of these observing in some of this observing information is shared with some of the policy making and decision making boards and commissions, particularly the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council and State of Alaska Board of Fish and Board of Game and other federal management councils. I think that might also I'm not sure if that's for from for the DBO crowd or the from Pam. But well, I'll let it, I'll I, it yeah, I can say something. Uh, we do share our data. Uh, there are members of the DBO team that are part of the 44 of the, the Pisces. Uh, there's a working group in the, for, the, for example, for the Northern Bering Sea that's connected providing information for the, uh, the National Marine Fisheries Science uh, for the, uh, the Management Council. Also through the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observing Network, they have a sub uh, membership in that. So some of this information of people we work with is getting through that way. Um, I gave a brief out at the State Department level, for example, on the DBO, uh, on just marine ecosystems also. So that was one way to convey to them. And at our Pacific Arctic group meetings, we often have agency members participating in that and they're learning about what the activities overall are in that Pacific area. So those are just some mechanisms that are brought forward. There probably could be more. Thanks, Jackie. I don't know if any of the other speakers want to jump in on that either. Or if any other folks I, have other, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Pam. Oh, I, yeah, I could just mention that. Um, I know that our a lot of our park managers um, along the, the coastal areas are, um, they provide information through those those two groups on a fairly regular basis. Um, but yeah, it's it's at a different level um, and, and we could probably get more information always to, to all of these groups. And, and, and that's something that we strive to do. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a, a quick question for Margaret. Um, so in, in your last slide, you talked a little bit about uh, your future work, which included um, ideas to build capacity, um, impacting policies and decision making. I'm wondering if you could just expand a little bit on that. I'm really curious to hear what you have in, in mind. Yeah, so that's not necessarily my personal work. I think it's collective work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think yeah, building capacity. So really thinking about who is funded to come into these spaces and who isn't. You know, are you asking in kind contributions? Are you actually paying people to contribute? meaningfully and be able to take the time to do that, actually have funded positions to do that. Cause it takes a lot of, it takes a lot, it's a big learning curve to come into this space. And so I, I think recognizing that and um, funding people to come into that in that way, as well as thinking about how we build capacities and in communities within individual projects and within agencies, you know, who are you funding at the ground level to do um, observations, to do work? I think at all levels, just thinking about representation and where funds are going and who is it actually benefiting? And I think the policy question, so thanks Allied, because I was curious too, is 
too, like, you know, is science actually impacting policy decisions or not? And kind of really questioning that. And how do we do science communication better? How do we engage better? How do we do co-production of knowledge better? So that's kind of what I was thinking as collective future work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that answer. I think there's a lot to be done, um, you know, especially in the world of connecting science and policymakers a little bit better. So I'll give it another second or two to see if there's any other questions. I know we're over time now. Olivia. Yeah, hi, I had a question for Pam. You mentioned that, you know, the Park Service gets a lot of visitors and it's a great opportunity to leverage information sharing with a broader audience. How do you think that other um, IRPIC collaboration team members or agencies can leverage that space um, to share their science? How, how can we do that? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think probably through efforts like this, um, through us uh, as federal scientists and NPS scientists, um, learning more about all of the IRPIC um, activities that are going on. I mean, it's, it's fairly eye-opening. We tend to work in our little silos. Um, so if we can engage at some level in some more of, of this type of um, interaction, we could then translate it to our visitors, which is easier said than done. I mean, we have a, a hard enough time trying to reach out to our visitors as it is. So um, pulling in more information um, would be difficult, but I think it, it all depends on your experience. If I go and talk to a visitor having just come out of this meeting um, and, and hearing some of the things that, um, that, that I picked up here, um, hearing some of the great um, information that Margaret just shared, um, I think that we just, it just builds bigger capacity within each of us to then translate to our, our visitors. And, and then I'll, I'll go and have a conversation with somebody who's going to be driving on one of those shuttle buses into Denali National Park this year and a conversation I have, maybe a five minute conversation about something I heard here, I can give to them and then they can translate it to a visitor. And I'm, I'm all about those like five minute elevator conversations where, you know, just, um, just a sentence or two about something you learned, talk about that to, to anyone and they'll bring that forward. And I think it's, yeah, just those, those opportunities for all of the visitors that we do have to the, um, to these national parks in Alaska is really, it's a great platform. So um, yeah, don't know if that answered it, but um, yeah, that's kind of my perspective. Great, thanks Pam. And thanks Olivia for that question. Um, so since we're a little bit over time, I'll just say thanks again to all of our speakers for your presentations today. They're really informative. I know I learned a lot and I hope everybody else on the call did today. I'll mention again that we have this next webinar coming up on February 8th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. And again, details for that will be available on the IRPIC Collaborations website. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and close out. Um, and thanks again to everybody for being here today. All right. Thanks, Max. Bye yeah, all. thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Nice to, nice to, nice to meet y'all. Yeah, bye-bye.